All right, here's the lecture on the rise and fall of Athenian democracy and a more general look at the legacy of ancient Greek civilization in the era of globalization. So what sort of wisdom can we get from the Greeks? And um, so that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. And this will be for the class tomorrow, Wednesday, the 29th. So I'm Plato. I grew up in Athens and I watched it fall apart. So I saw, I started a school of future leaders so that they would learn about how Athens developed from within the context of Greek culture and then how it eventually destroyed itself. So I wanted my students, I wanted to let them know you are the future leaders. You will have power. You will be authority figures and in some field, and you will also be citizens. And I'm telling you, you must rule for the benefit of the ruled. Use your power to promote the well being of other people, the people who need what it is you know your expertise. And also think of yourself as a citizen. What is it that everyone needs collectively so that everyone can flourish? And if you don't do this, if you just take the privilege you have that got you here to, learn, to read my dialogues and come to my school and you go back to your city states and you just use it for money pleasure, power, and glory, your society will be less stable. You will hand on a worse society to your children and your grandchildren. Is that what you want? Do not deny that this is what happens because I saw it and I know this is what happens. If you, people with authority abuse it. But let me tell you more about the background, the religious context within which I grew up. So it's called spiritual humanism. And what that means is living for the sake of something greater than yourself is natural. And it's necessary. Human beings don't just live for eating, sleeping, reproducing. They have higher goals for better or worse. They want more out of life. Plus, because we are by nature born so vulnerable that we need each other tremendously, we need extended families to take care of kids. Then we need education, health care, um, transportation, agriculture. Um, we need the creation of goods and services to take care of our needs. Plus, we need the distribution so that everyone can be in the middle class. So the Greek deities represent, our, their life stories represent people who are passionate about one thing and they, um, they lose track of all the other sacred passions. But let me just show you the list. Um, Zeus is the God of justice. So he's the one that represents that realm of culture where people make laws or somebody makes laws and enforces those laws. Um, and that's necessary for people to live within a high quality community. Athena is the goddess of justice, war, and the arts. Poseidon is the god of the sea. 
So he represents human emotion. And people are emotional, right? And so there's nothing wrong with it. It's just when it goes too far. Demeter is the god of fertility. So obviously, she's the one who nurtures babies and also is the goddess of the earth, the fertility of the earth and the fertility of uh, human beings and animals. Hades is the god of the underworld. So when people live their lives, they, Hades reminds you that you leave a legacy behind. You made the world better or worse, and you have a story. People will tell stories about you. So when Odysseus goes to Hades and he runs into Achilles and Agamemnon, he, they are telling their story of the legacy they left behind. And so what they say reminds the rest of us that we want to make sure we leave behind a good story that we um, educated people in how to live. Persephone is the goddess of the underworld. She's the one that punishes you if you do evil in this world. She was victimized herself by Hades. She was raped and abducted by Hades. And when she gets there, she's the one that punishes those who misbehave. Apollo is the god of reason, music, medicine. Um, this is the god who you associate with going to college or taking a college class. You just learn, learn a bunch of stuff. You memorize some stuff, maybe you apply it to an example. It's, you're a detached observer. You just accumulate knowledge in your head and eventually you get a degree and then you get a job because you've taken all these classes and you know all this stuff. So that's the God of reason. And um, he, the kind of music Apollo likes is very tempered, very um, rational, right? Not very emotional. And the god of medicine, obviously, that's how the sciences. Um, Artemis is the goddess of the hunt. This is his sister. She loves the wilderness. So Apollo, with his use of reason, builds technology, builds skyscrapers, cities, right? That's, you have to use that left brain capacity in order to um, build a city. His sister doesn't care about that. She's the goddess of the hunt. Ares is the god of war. So human beings as societies are also vulnerable. So they do need national security. They do need protection from outside threats. The thing about Ares is that sometimes he values war too much and he doesn't value diplomacy how to prevent war. And that's where Zeus and, and uh, Athena will come in and try to negotiate because violence, just war, just showing your strength and being violent is not necessarily the best way to gain long-term peace between countries. Hera is the goddess of honor. So Ares is her son, because people do honor soldiers who protect us, which is legit. It's just that she also um, engages in uh, developing ways that people relate to each other in a society to create a higher quality of life. So for example, Hera today, in our, our world, might be on the park board, the school board, the hospital board, all these uh, communities. She might be organizing charity balls 
where the community um, contributes, right? You, you come to the party, you donate money, and it goes to help some institution or some group of people in the town. So this is um, her role as the wife of Zeus is to develop a quality of life. Zeus can make the laws and set up the institutions, but there's way more to human culture than just following the laws. So that's why in every institution, including Lyon College, they always have honor day. And honor day is when you uh, honor people because they've gone over and above what they needed to do according to the job description. They just make extra efforts. So that's Hera's role. Dionysus is the god of wine. He's, he's the wild child. Um, and he's the only god that dies and is reborn. And in the theater, the theater plays out these scenarios where people give in to really irrational passions. And the and the audience is supposed to react with horror and just say, no, I don't want to do that. So you flush that out. So you, you kill it, not in the sense of repressing it. You really get over it. And you're reborn, able to act more creatively, more positively. So he's the one who dies and is reborn and is the god of the theater. So people remember what the point of the tragedy is. Aphrodite is the goddess of love and beauty. So she's not just a sexual object for men. This is not her main role. Her main role is to, when she's married to Hephaestus, the god of the forge, he creates um, a city that's well organized. He creates housing that's well crafted, well built, pleasant to the eye, um, style, design. He develops furniture, uh, dishes, all the material things we need in life. He doesn't just make them for the bare minimal. Um, he makes them beautiful. And then human beings respond to sensuous beauty. So it's a calming influence. It's a way that you are stimulated visually in your, uh, visually mostly, to remind you that everything around you in a, that's human made has to be a combination of functional, but also beautiful. Functional alone is not enough. Then Hestia is the goddess of the heart. And she's the one where people in their families at home sit around the table or the hearth in those days, and they talk. And the light of the mind is ignited. So that's where children start talking to their parents about whatever life. And as they do this, they become more aware of their lives and more capable of reflecting. Their character is developed through these conversations. And so then the, the flame at the hearth is taken by Hermes. He goes out into the world and sends the messenger from the gods to humans. Well, human beings have the light of the mind ignited at home, hopefully, and then they go into the world and they make their contribution to society. So all of those deities are living for the sake of something greater than ourselves. And this would be the legacy that we want to leave behind. So when you come to college, you are exposed at a liberal arts college. All of the faculty could actually make more money doing something else, but they all feel called to do what they do. 
They do it because they think it's important. And you then, students are exposed to all these possibilities and you find out what really inspires you, what it is you wanna do with your life. So this is a summary of the different deities and how they have a male and female counterpart. Um, then the muses are the, the arts. So the Greeks thought that the poets, the artists were the people who educated the soul educates your emotions, which in turn affect your thoughts and your actions and your way of life. Um, so these are, there were nine of them. One of them is music, obviously. Then there's history. Every one of the muses, the poet's gift is that they can recognize a pattern in human affairs or a pattern in the natural world that if you understand that pattern, they're trying to teach you how to live and what not to do and what to do. But they do it by telling a story that reflects the pattern. So the history, um, finding patterns in history. So Thucydides was a historian who told the story of how Athens lost its democracy. And in the beginning of the book, he says, I'm handing this on to posterity with the hope that people will learn the lessons that I learned from life so that, so that uh, we can avoid making the same mistakes. <clears throat> so then there's um, lyric poetry about love and eroticism. So Obviously, sexual attraction is a huge um, force in human life because that's how we get reproduction. You know, of course, sex is going to be pleasant. But if you reflect on it, you create poetry about it, you can avoid chasing after people, undermining your family. You can link those passions with a person and develop a history with that person. So over time, you're relating to that person as a human being and also as a biological creature, but you put them together. Um, uh, let's see. And music. Let's see. Uh, sacred hymns. So religious music is always trying to indicate there's something higher than yourself. So it's, I don't know, you go to church, you sing certain hymns. They're always trying to get you directed to there, there are forces beyond you. Um, then tragedy is this story of people giving into these passions and having to flush them out. Dance is one of the muses because it, it integrates your body, your emotions, and your thoughts, and your way of life. And then um, comedy was also a way to learn to get educated because a lot of times comedy is the easiest way because people will be defensive. So you can't accuse people of being wicked, they'll just get defensive. So instead you tell a story where people are acting in ways that really hurt other people, but they're not aware of it. And so, and it's funny, you know, and so your, your mind is more open when you think, well, that's, that's funny or that's kind of cringy. And then you, you learn, gee, I don't want to do that. One example is in South, um, South Africa. There, one of the comedians was given a peace prize because he would tell stories and he would have dramas or write comedies where, for example, the white women were in the hairdressing, in the beauty shop, 
And they were talking about African Americans in these derogatory ways. But then the African Americans were right there doing their hair. And so it's tragic and comic, but people in the audience could go, oh, I do that, right? And But now all of a sudden they see the harm that it does. And so the comedy can really educate you. Um, and then the astronomy and astrology. So astronomy is when people study the universe and the patterns, you could have a mathematician or, or um, physics. I know one of the, at least one of the students in the class studies physics, Colin. And what you look at is the beauty of it and the order of it, and that we are in this universe that's bigger than we are. And our job or our purpose is just to understand our place but to understand that it's so much bigger than we are. And then to try to learn all these patterns, learn these lessons from the past so that we, we live well, we flourish and we pass on a flourishing life to the next generation. Uh, okay, so here's the outline of Plato speaking, what he loved about his culture his uncle, my uncle, uh, wrote the Constitution of Athens, and it tried to weave together the rich and the poor to create a strong and stable middle class. And so this was a higher level of culture than just family life or just meeting survival needs. It's a whole different layer of civilization where we can actually create artistic artistic expression, right? Create music, create dance, create religious songs, all those things, right? You have to have leisure time to be able to do that. This goes beyond survival. Um, you can also have scientific inquiry just for its own sake. It's not just to make something so you can survive better. You just study the universe because it's beautiful and it's very satisfying to study it. Um, citizen engagement in public life. So now you relate to people and in your task is to create a middle class and create laws and institutions that promote everyone's well-being. Whereas if you're just working in the business sector, it's completely personally driven by profit and you treat people well just so they'll come back so that's just mere life survival but the political community is about the good life and i thought my city there were there were political geniuses who had organized all these institutions and passed them down to me so what would a political genius be able to do. Create a community of just citizens, weave the community together. How do you do that? We well, have laws and institutions, but they have to be well structured and they have to be well managed. Develop it, preserve a strong middle class. It's really important. The criminal justice system will give people a fair trial and also um, try to promote their uh, healing, you know, try to get them so that you can send them back into the world rehabilitated. Um, avoid invading other countries for wealth and avoid paranoia about other countries. Just maintain diplomatic relationships and peaceful relationships. Um, provide opportunity. So education provides opportunities for citizens to develop their talents and then use them to benefit other people. Um, and a system that rewards the people with the commitment and the ability. But if you're good at something, then you should get the job 
that you're good at if you're the best person for the job. And so the educational system should set it up so that everybody gets educated according to what they naturally can do and like to do, and then are given the job that triggers that particular capacity. There's also an informal system of education, the marketplace of ideas. So people came, and I'll, I'll show you that picture in a minute. There's the Parthenon. So I'm going to show you the pictures now. This is um, what I was talking about in class last time. And this is where, I don't know, somehow this is different than it used to be, but I guess, I guess, oh, exit full screen. All right. Okay. All right, so the Parthenon was the temple to Athena. You walk slowly up to the temple because you're integrating your biological drives and your emotional drives. And you're coming to the temple and uh, worshiping Athena. So you're triggering your own capacity. Athena gave you this capacity. When you think about her, it triggers your idea of justice and your love of justice. Okay, the temple was built proportionately because we have a natural response to beauty. Gosh, okay. Um, it's the unity of nature and culture. And next door to the temple is a courthouse. And that's where people, once that capacity for justice, that gift from Athena is given to us, then we go over to the courts and we govern it, govern ourselves. We use that capacity to govern ourselves and each other. Somebody breaks a law, so the criminal justice system. Um, so this is a court to emphasize the criminal justice system, but there's also uh, civil courts and there's also um, just the whole notion of creating a body of laws and institutions. Um, okay, um, here's the, here's the uh, temp, uh, theater where you go and you flush out your emotions that need flushing out. Here's the Olympic Stadium. And we had a philosophy of a sound mind and a sound body. And um, the way of practicing medicine was prevention, right? Wellness. So that's what the Olympics is about. Staying healthy, exercising, getting the right kind of food. And um, then every once in a while you get sick, you take this um, drink and it makes you throw up and have diarrhea. So whatever is in your body that was poisonous gets flushed out and you can move on with your life. The temple to Hephaestus, the god of the forge, he, as I said, he makes everything uh, beautiful that we need for our basic needs, but he adds that we are human beings. We need something over and above just uh, the minimal. Okay, so here's the marketplace. There's the temple to Athena. It's casting her shadow, reminding us that we need to love justice. Okay, so people come to the marketplace on the weekends, probably to buy what they need. But when they get there, especially the rural people who are citizens, right? So they need to come into the city and then they need to get informed 
about public life because when it comes their turn, they, they are picked by lot totally randomly. They have to sit on a jury or sit on the assembly. So um, when, okay, so the, the, the negative thing about Greece, and I have no problem uh, thinking about the negative things about Greece, but in order to qualify to be a voter, you had to be male and Greek, and you had to have a certain amount of property. So it was definitely not as inclusive as our democracy is now, but it was way more inclusive than anything else they knew of. So its history should be marching forward, right? The arc of history should be toward more and more expansion of who has access to the highest levels of education and citizen engagement. All right. So then um, after they buy their material goods, they come over and the rural people who have been chosen to be on a jury have to stay in some apartments. And so the apartments are there, plus it's announced, there's an announcement of what jury trials are being held at that time. Then there is an assembly of leaders, people who decide what is going to be voted on in the assembly. So the assembly is like Congress, um, except there was just one body and the people were chosen by lot. They weren't elected. And then they voted on whatever it is that the city was deliberating about. And they would announce that. So the council that prioritized what was getting looked at, the announcement of that would be there. Then there were three little temples to Zeus, Apollo, and Ares, the god of justice, the god of reason, the god of war. And so it's reminding you, make sure when you're making decisions about war, which are some of the most important ones, that you um, use your reason and you love justice. Right? Don't be driven by emotions, no matter how tempting that might be. Okay, so then after you look, you check out the media center, right? This is like a journalism. You find out what's going on in the news and you remember you need to, to think about justice and reasoning. Then there's an open space for people to come and talk. So the city is organized to tell you as a citizen, we want you to be informed. We want you to be engaged. We depend on you to behave yourself as a juror and as a member of the assembly. We depend on you to love justice and to love reason. Um, so then the temple to Poseidon is down at the end of the, um, uh peninsula that Athens is on. That's the god of the sea. Then there's the Zeus, the god of justice. There's a story about how he got a thunderbolt. I don't want to tell that to you now because it's uh, this is going to be long enough. And there's a temple to um, Aspasia, women's health. So when you go down to the Piraeus, the port, you go, um, the first island that you get to is that this temple is located there. So when women had issues like menstrual issues, pregnancy, childcare, menopause, all that sort of stuff, they'd go to the temple um, of Aspasia. And it's beautiful there. Then on the islands was where the people who were speculating about the first principles of reality. They would have, were in little communities. Um, all right, and then dialogue. So the way to put all these passions together is that you have to talk to each other.
you have to have really meaningful dialogue. Um, I won't talk about Corinth and I'm not gonna talk about Delphi. It's okay, but it's great. <laughs> I go there a lot. This is the goddess of, of uh, health, Hygieia. It's mental health, spiritual health, physical health. And here's how it got corrupted. And this is what really grieves me, right? So here we had this great society, but we fought against the Persians. The Persians were a completely authoritarian society. They just had one king who, who dressed up like a god and got worshipped. And no, the citizens were not engaged in public life. They were not informed. They were just told what to do. So everybody's a slave. So that's at least what the Greeks thought. So the Persians invaded them. And they were the Greeks were outnumbered eight to one. But they won. They hid behind. They used their geography to, um, they cornered the Persian troops, for example, came up a mountain pass, they surrounded them. And so, you know, they didn't have anywhere to go. And so they all died, most of them. Then they went, also they had these huge ships that came into the bay. And so their little ships, the Greeks had small ships that sort of blocked off the way, the way out. And so they just starved them out. Um, so anyway, it was a great flourishing. And you, you beat the Persians and you just think, ah, we're the greatest. This is what the gods, this is affirmation that the gods believe in our system better than that. And um, then even before that war was over, the two most powerful city-states were Athens and Sparta. And they started getting paranoid about each other. Each one thought the other one was going to attack them. So they tried to make power blocks. They, they forced the other city states to take sides. And the other city states did not want to. It's like, you guys go beat each other up. We don't care. Leave us alone. And so on the island of Melos, which was pretty strategically located, they, um, the citizens had decided if the Spartans land or if the Athenians land and they want us to join their league, just we're, we're going to stand up for our city state. That's it. And so the Athenians came and the Malians said, get out. <laughs> But the Athenians said, look, the reality of life, they're very cynical, right? Might makes right. If we don't take you, the Spartans will take you. Or the Spartans will think we're too weak to take you and they'll go after us. So I'm sorry. You know, if you refuse, you're going to regret it. And they still refuse. And the Athenians killed off the males and um, really destroyed the whole island. And so, so um, that's how, and let me talk more about how it got corrupted. Everything got corrupted. So how did this work? Um, all right. So, how do you think, where do they get the money to build all these monuments to democracy? Well, they got it by taxing their um, allies so that the ally, the other city states that were in part of their power block didn't have enough money to have their own flourishing society. They taxed them and then they used the spoils of war from if they conquered they used the, they took the, the losers money and made their monuments to democracy. And 
when you if you really are a democrat if you conquer somebody you should you can keep some of the spoils in case something happens don't spend it because then people will be motivated to go to war just to get wealth to spend so that shouldn't ever be a motive so if you conquer somebody give them a chance to rebuild as long as they can't have military equipment, but don't take all their money, make them destitute, and don't use the money to build monuments to democracy. <laughs> okay, so everybody hated Athens. I mean, the other city states really did not like Athens and they knew they were hypocrites. All right, the other city state was Sparta. Sparta was dedicated to victory in war so when a little boy was born the greatest honor for their parents would be if their boy grew up to be a brave soldier in war maybe then a general and then if you were good at that you became a political leader so everything about the society was uh, oriented toward victory in war now um, the Athenians, on the other hand, said, well, war is for the sake of peace, you know, that's barbaric, right? War is not the end. War is the means. Sometimes you try to prevent war, but it's for the sake of peace. It's so we can create art and science and beauty and truth. You know, so we can have this flourishing society and citizen engagement. We can avoid authoritarianism. That's what life is about. So what did the Spartans think of the Athenians? They thought they were a bunch of undisciplined, unpatriotic, unreligious, atheist, um, uh, degenerates. They're just degenerate, right? They just do whatever they want. They call it cultural superiority. And the Spartans, no, we have discipline. We're dedicated to our city. We give our life for our city. We honor the people who give their lives for their city. That's the ultimate goal. Okay, what did the Athenians think? Well, they're a bunch of barbarians. Like they don't know what life is about. It's about truth, justice, beauty, the arts, whatever. So they didn't like each other's philosophy about life. They didn't like each other's cities, but they also were paranoid about each other because these were the two most powerful. So that's how the monuments got built by undermining, by taking everybody else's money, which is not very democratic. Um, then how did the courts get corrupted? The courts got corrupted because foreigners came in and educated young people in how to speak persuasively so that when they, if they are, have to defend themselves in court, they will be able to convince the jury that they're not guilty. Or you could learn rhetoric speaking persuasively and hire yourself out as a lawyer who could get anybody rich enough off the hook. If you get paid a lot, you can make a lot of money as a lawyer who's um, defending clients, right? Then um, the other capacity where you need to speak persuasively is when you go in front of the assembly and you want people to vote for whatever it is you want, like uh, going to war is the big one, whether we should go to war or not. So these foreigners who really didn't care, it's not their city, but they would come to Athens and teach, get, make a lot of money teaching persuasion. And um, so the courts got corrupted, right, by people didn't even care anymore about reasoning. They just, the sophists, the foreigners who educated, taught 
uh, their students to appeal to emotion, appeal to bad arguments, blame the other guy. There's all sorts of logical fallacies that trigger people's irrational emotions and thoughts. And that's the art of persuasion. Well, then the people on the juries expected to be emotionally manipulated. They forgot that the whole point of it was to use your reason and not be emotional and be fair and look at the evidence. Um, so the courts were corrupted. The theater was corrupted because people started thinking that the poets were just telling them, well, this is the way it is. People are irrational and that's just the way it is. And Zeus and Apollo, powerful men just go off and have sex with young women and ruin their families, but boys will be boys. And like they thought that Homer and the poets were feeding these irrational emo emotions when actually they were trying to bring about a purgation so that you would break the chain of wanting to behave that way. But they lost track of it. All they, they just started to believe freedom really meant the license to live however you like. And that was the, the ultimate corruption of the society was to think that freedom means everybody's free to do what they want. You want to get rich? Go ahead. You want to get powerful? Go ahead. You know, whatever. It's a free country. Uh, the Olympics got corrupted because people, um, it got really professionalized. It was supposed to be like a sound mind and a sound body. Well, that's not what happened pretty soon. Young people were sort of picked out as having a talent for being a javelin thrower, a wrestler, or a chariot driver, these various things. And they went through all this training, very professionalized. Um, so when they went to the Olympics, to Olympia, they had a whole entourage of people with them. They would have the coach, and then the person who assessed what their daily exercise routine should be. And then they'd have the trainer that actually followed through on it. And then they would have this person with this thing that looked like a sickle. And um, grease is dusty. So they put uh, oil, olive oil on them while they were wrestling, while they were exercising practicing, but the dust would always come and stick to the oil and make kind of a mess. So there was one person who had this little sickle that came and sort of wiped it off. So that's, I mean, that's how seriously they took it. So they got so well geared, they got so geared toward their specific sports that they weren't even that overall healthy because they their bodies were so conditioned to just do this one thing. And then the most people were just couch potatoes, right? They would go to the Olympics and make it into a big party, <laughs> a drunken brawl. And also the city states that held the Olympics. Olympia was once every four years, but Corinth, it was also held there. There were four different places. And um, instead of using the resources of the city for overall wellness for everybody, they would save up all this money so they could have this huge bash when it was their turn to have the Olympics. So, and then the practice of medicine, instead of I'm sick, you drink this thing, you throw up, you have diarrhea. Instead of that, in the doctors that made the most money were the ones who would pander to people who did not take care of themselves. They didn't eat right, they didn't exercise. And so they would get these diseases or, I don't know, heartburn, you name it. And, and the doctors would have all these uh, skill at developing techniques, excuse me, techniques 
or medicines to cure people who, who, for whom the cause of their illness was just their personal vice. But it made a lot of money. So, so it got cr corrupted by money. Then the Hephaestus, uh, the god of the forge, was corrupted because he's supposed to use his talents to create style and design for people in their, in their material well-being. But instead, he's using all of his skills to make swords and shields for war. Um, and here's how the, the marketplace got corrupted because the original idea was people would come from all over the world to um, exchange goods. The business people at the Agora would travel all over, bring back stuff. And that was supposed to create um, friendship bonds between city-states so that they wouldn't go to war with each other because they had so many um, business interests in trade. They had trade was a big deal. So um, that was the idea. The trouble was, as it got more corrupt, Athens would make unfair, you know, uh, trade deals. And so it would create animosity. The other thing is they would sell stuff and they could sell little statues of the different gods and goddesses in other city states. And people would just go, oh yeah, okay, they have that and they have that. And it's just sort of, it's meaningless and worthless. Different strokes for different folks. It's all relative, you know. You grow up in this city state and you basically worship Hera the most. And over here, you grow up over here and this is a center for Demeter, but whatever floats your boat, it doesn't matter. It's not what's important. Um, the temple to Poseidon is at the end of the peninsula. So Poseidon can see the ships leaving for fighting the Persians. That was a just war. That was a necessary war. But then they see the ships leaving to fight the Spartans. And that was a war motivated by the desire for empire. So Athens started empire building, which was not democratic at all. Um, so the other thing that happened is that as Athens became less stable, um, people, religious people thought, we've got to get back to the gods. We've got to get back to our traditional religion because, you know, God is punishing us for not being, not, for not praying enough, for not worshiping them enough. We have all these atheist uh, speculators about natural causes and we need to believe that Zeus is the cause of the thunderbolt. We don't want those guys explaining it in a natural way. Um, and then women's health, the downside of that is how many women came there to run away from abuse or rape or any kind of uh, exercise of male power and domination over women. Okay, and then the dialogues, okay, people are having, di oh, here's the islands. So another reason the speculators about the natural causes were um, living on these islands was because they would get killed if they were in Athens. They were considered atheists and also atheists who were the cause of why this society was going down was because the gods were mad at them. Um, then, so then you have to have dialogues about what's going on. So these dialogues got corrupted by cynicism and the belief that what Athens really needs is to go back to traditional religion, to blind patriotism, to um, caring more about your family than about your society. Um, and so that's, 
that got corrupted. And so Socrates was the gadfly, and we will talk about him in a couple of days. He went around asking people what they think about justice and truth in the agora, in the public square. And so people who had positions of authority had to answer his questions. And they were exposed as actually not knowing what they needed to know. The public trusted them to know about justice or truth or medicine or whatever. And they really didn't know. And so the people around them started to question the authorities and the people with privilege started to doubt that they really were legitimate. And then um, instead of being grateful to Socrates, because if you want a democracy, people have to use their authority for the well being of the rules. And when his questions expose them, as actually using it for their own reputations or helping their families. They should have been grateful to him, but of course they weren't. He got arrested for not believing in the city's gods because he, he was accused of being an atheist because he didn't blindly take the stories literally or, um, and also corrupting the youth because the young men whose fathers were off taking care of the city, would come and listen to Socrates while he was questioning them. And they would start to see how these people they were taught to um, obey really didn't know what they're doing. And so they got cynical, they got rebellious. And they, so the elders accused Socrates of corrupting the youth. And he got the hemlock and he died. So what I started the academy, I started my school and I wrote my dialogues so that people would engage in dialogues about what is it that has changed over the 2,500 years and what has not changed. Um, so, uh, I think that the way Plato wrote this, he had a, a good idea. And so the question is, can we keep a free and open society alive? What does it take to keep it alive? And will I dedicate my life to promoting, to using my authority for the well-being of the people over whom I have it? Um, so that was, that's really what I want you to think about. Oh, let's see how I can get out of this. Um, yes. Uh, whoops. Um, so those are, those are the main issues for next time. I have these questions. Why, why do you think Americans or anyone still studies the Greeks? What do you know or what have, have you heard about them? What do you know about Greek mythology? Um, how does that connect with why Americans study the Greeks? But, but mostly, what do you think makes a society great, right? What is a great society? And then what do you think corruption means? What does it mean when you say a leader is corrupt? What makes a person corrupt? What makes a society corrupt? What is it about America that makes it great? And what is it about America that is corrupt and making it you know, less stable and less just. Um, what do you think needs to be preserved? And what do you think needs to be changed in order for our society to improve? So I look forward to your responses to these questions. And I will start out the class 
by asking each of you to speak like I did today. So um, that's it. And I hope it hasn't taken too long. I guess I'll find out after I close it down. And there is office hours after class each day. So I might see you then if you have questions. You can email me also. Um, and I, I'm happy to address those emails. Thank you.